Good evening, I'm Ian Hedemansen. Using tech to slow the spread of COVID-19. If enough people sign up, this app can help prevent future outbreaks of COVID-19. Now there's an app for that, how it works and the challenges. The long weekend has arrived for most Canadians and health officials are hoping it doesn't lead to a spike. Summer doesn't make the virus go away. It is right there just waiting for an invitation to a party or gathering. Why small businesses are falling through the cracks in many Canadian communities. Small business survival really depends on a better, more inclusive rent relief program. And after four and a half months, hockey is back. NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman on player safety, fan energy, and racial injustice in the league. What would you do if a player wants to kneel during the anthem? This is The National. As more businesses in this country reopen and more Canadians gather and travel, a new phone app is being rolled out to try to slow the spread of the coronavirus. The app is called COVID Alert, designed to let you know if you've been close to someone who has since tested positive for the virus. But while it's meant to go national, it isn't there yet. Thomas Dagla explains how it works. That device that many can't live without could help fight the virus we can't wait to live without. That is if Canadians install the new app, meant to alert them of potential contact with a COVID-19 carrier. Among the app's first users and its chief boosters is the Prime Minister. Now that we have the system up and running in Ontario, in our largest province, uh, it will hopefully be up, be up and running for local public health agencies right across the country in the coming weeks. Here's how it works. The COVID alert app logs when another user spends at least 15 minutes less than two meters away. It uses Bluetooth technology and doesn't track location data. When someone tests positive, they're asked to enter a code, letting others know they may have been exposed. This cybersecurity expert likes what he sees. When it comes to the security elements of it, when it comes to the privacy elements, I think this is one of the best apps, contact tracing, exposure notification apps that I've seen. And there are plenty around the world to compare it to. The problem is, in major countries, the apps have been downloaded by fewer than 1 in 10 people on average and the software is useless without users. So what's the target here? I don't know that I can tell you precisely, but obviously the more people who sign up uh, to use or download the app, the, the more uh, useful it would be. Alberta tried its own app, but it suffered from less sophisticated technology. In Ontario, it could bolster contact tracing efforts or provide a false sense of security to some. It can, after the fact of exposure, maybe help us when we're doing the actual hard work of contact tracing to prevent further exposure. But it does not keep you safe. The app might help, but it can't replace hand washing, masking and physical distancing. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Well, most Canadians are heading into a long weekend and in the time of COVID-19, relaxation for the public can mean tension for public health officials. The virus is the unintended consequence gates crashing your well-intended backyard gathering and potentially affecting the health of your family and community. So this weekend, plan to keep it small and don't let your guard down. If we look at average daily cases since the last long weekend in Quebec, Alberta and BC in particular, roughly two weeks after Canada Day, they started to creep up. The sources of infection vary, but at least some were linked to private parties. Today, B.C. announced its highest number of new infections in a single day since April. Greg Rasmussen shows us how in this province, the effort now is to avoid a bigger increase driven by the long weekend. Sun, sand, football, enough to make it all seem almost normal. But these 18-year-olds are keeping to a small bubble. In public, we're not going up to strangers and yeah. keeping... But within, within, our, within our friend group, we're pretty liberal. Definitely challenging, but like, I guess you just adapt to it. Some are worried about people taking greater risks. We built up all these good social distancing rules and precautions, and now that's just, that's just gone, which is kind of upsetting because I know we take it seriously, and it just seems like others don't. Officials fear the combination of a sunny, long weekend and the lure of large social gatherings will cause people to drop their guard. Let's make this long weekend a different one than what we saw in early July. 
The worry is a repeat of events like this one earlier this month. A poster advertising a large beach party for tonight has BC's health minister upset. I think people do need to give their head a shake a little bit here. To keep people in line, the city of Kelowna is putting teams on the streets. We're kind of here roaming the beaches, just ensuring everybody's safety right now. Using reminders rather than fines or arrests. Yeah, it's just not possible to have enforcement or bylaw officers um, everywhere. Uh, where people are gathering in our community. While some are calling for a crackdown, softer educational nudges may be more effective. If you lead with enforcement, then you push the behaviors underground. And the worst thing we could do is cause an outdoor party to move indoors. That would be much more dangerous. At the beach, a call for vigilance. A lot of people are doing the right things and trying to make the effort to take precautions. And there's a lot of people that are kind of just ignoring everything. and doing what they want to do and pretending like COVID's over, but it's still, you know, a reality that we need to face every day. A reality that will last far longer than this long weekend. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. The Prime Minister faced tough questions again today about the deal his government struck with We Charity, which has ties to the Trudeaus and Bill Morneau. As Evan Dyer shows us, today he defended his finance minister. Today... I want to talk about where we are on a number of important items. One day after a raucous committee appearance, the first by a sitting Prime Minister in many years, this morning the PM was ready to turn the page. In just the past week, we've seen COVID-19 cases rising in many communities. But reporters still wanted to know more about we, and the Prime Minister repeated his claim that he'd initially opposed the idea of giving the student grant program to the we organization. I pushed back. I should have, in hindsight, pulled away and said, I don't want to be involved in this at all. I shouldn't because of family connections. Yesterday at the Finance Committee, the PM was pressed about who should take the fall for the affair. Someone in Cabinet should be held accountable. Which minister will you fire? And Trudeau didn't respond, but neither he nor his chief of staff made a public defense of their finance minister, who's under attack for accepting $41,000 worth of travel from We Charity for two trips in 2017. Today, Trudeau seemed more protective of Morneau. You know, he uh, apologized and he should not have uh, accepted uh, the uh, elements of that that were gifts. But at the same time, the work that we're doing, the work that uh, he has done as finance minister and continues to do in being there for Canadians, as I talked about today. And Trudeau also defended the finance minister's decision to accept foreign trips for his family as we volunteers. I think... Obviously, there's uh, questions for, uh, for Mr. Morneau that he has uh, uh, already addressed, but the idea that someone on their personal vacation would uh, choose to support a good cause or uh, get involved in helping make the world a better place uh, is not something that we should uh, you know, reject or turn away from. Of course, the finance minister is not under fire for volunteering to build a school in Ecuador, but rather for letting we pay for that trip and another one for his wife and daughter to Kenya. But today, the prime minister seemed to signal he's hoping Bill Morneau can survive in his post, at least for the time being. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Gatineau. Tonight, the Ontario government says it will not be renewing its contract with We Charity after it announced $250,000 in funding for a We program to nurture empathy in students. Ontario's Ministry of Education has also been directed to investigate what has been spent up until now. A spokesperson says the allegations against we raise, quote, serious questions. The government announced extensions to several COVID-19 benefit programs today, including the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which is set to wind down in the coming weeks. Our goal is to transition everyone on the CERB to employment insurance. And for those who don't qualify for EI right now, like gig or contract workers, we will create a transitional parallel benefit that is similar to employment insurance. The plan also includes access to training and the ability to work extra hours without having payments reduced. More than 8 million Canadians have received CERB benefits so far. Also announced today, more financial support for hard-hit guest workers essential to Canada's food supply. Our government is investing almost $59 million to protect the health and safety of migrant workers on Canadian farms. This will fund more farm inspections, provide emergency relief when needed, and improve the overall living conditions on farms. 
This newly announced money is on top of the $100 million set aside for the agriculture sector back in May. Trudeau said the government is also looking at ways to improve the temporary foreign workers program, including mandatory requirements for better living standards. 1,100 migrant workers have tested positive for COVID-19 in Ontario. Three have died. The government extended the rent relief program for small business owners today as well. It has been heavily criticized for putting the onus on landlords to apply instead of simply giving money to tenants, many of whom say they'll go under without radical changes. Peter Armstrong explains. George Ed Carter is one of the lucky ones. Her business is open and her landlord applied for rent relief. Carter is only doing a fraction of the business she'd normally do, so the rent relief has been crucial. Right now we're operating on a part-time basis. That's a huge impact for us and with the, with the rent reduction program, it definitely eliminates a lot of that pressure. For those who accessed it, the program's been a lifeline, but only a small handful of businesses have actually been given a break on rent. The current system requires applicants to prove they've lost 70% of their revenue and it puts all the power in the hands of the landlords, many of whom just haven't bothered to apply for the program leaving their tenants without any options. Small business survival really depends on a better, more inclusive rent relief program being rolled out quickly. One that helps tenants get relief even if landlords haven't cooperated and won't ever. About half a million businesses should qualify, but just 63,000 have actually received money. So hundreds of thousands of business owners are watching the bills pile up with no relief in sight. Since COVID and the landlord refused, I just decided to give up. Jin Lee runs the Chinese Arts and Crafts Store, a mainstay of Vancouver's Chinatown. Her landlord's demanding months' worth of rent, and she's only just reopened. I am cried. Yeah. I cried many times, yeah. but yeah, because it's sad. Nobody can help me. Community advocates like Michael Tan say this is a growing problem. He says smaller businesses don't have lobbyists and lawyers to help them navigate the system. And even though shops have reopened, hardly any of them are operating at full capacity. The need is urgent. I mean, we've already seen this announcement of Chinese art crafts. They'll be closing in September. That leaves us two months to find some sort of remedy for them. And or else they will be the first of many. And if there is a wave of closures, it's small shops like these that make up the fabric of towns and neighborhoods that'll be the first to go. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. There is little debate, even in the United States, that the country is struggling with COVID-19. It continues to spread at a pace recorded nowhere else in the world. Since a lull back in mid-June, daily new cases in the United States have tripled to an average of more than 60,000. The pace of deaths from the disease rising now to more than 1,000 lives lost daily. Research has shown the deaths lag cases by several weeks. If we account for that lag by shifting deaths back, say, a month, the similarity in trend lines underscores concerns about how much worse this could get. But Stephen D'Souza shows us Washington is no closer to a unified response to the virus or its economic impact. He is the face that Americans have come to trust to give them the straight goods on the coronavirus. And today, he addressed the lack of a federal response to it. So help you, God. There was such a diversity of response in this country from different states that we really did not have a unified bringing everything down. He spent most of the hearing avoiding attempts by both sides to use him to make partisan points. The government limit the protesting. I, I, I don't think that's relevant to... And he offered some hopeful news on the rush to find a vaccine. We feel cautiously optimistic that we will have a vaccine by the end of this year and as we go into 2021. But testing problems continue to plague cities across the U.S. Officials blamed high demand and warned increased testing alone isn't enough. We cannot test our way out of this or any other pandemic. Testing does not replace personal responsibility. For some, the issue with testing is a symptom of a larger problem. We're four months into this thing, um, and I think our governments and our private sector are failing us. The failure for many Americans is not just the handling of the virus, but the economic fallout. Tonight, the first batch of relief measures will expire, so close to 30 million Americans will lose a $600 unemployment insurance payment and eviction protection. What we're seeing is politics as usual, 
from Democrats up on Cap Capitol Hill. Democrats the White House blamed Democrats for the lack of progress on a new relief bill. Zero. Democrats say Republicans have been arguing amongst themselves for weeks. We passed a bill 10 weeks ago. It was bipartisan. Meanwhile, in hard-hit Florida, Trump didn't mention any financial aid package, but did speak about his re-election chances. So I think we're doing really well in Florida. Critics say with a mini-rally and fundraisers planned, Trump's visit to the politically vital state shows just where his priorities lie. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. A U.S. federal appeals court overturned the death sentence of the Boston Marathon bomber. Josar Sarnayev will get a new sentencing hearing. The court ruled his 2015 trial didn't meet the standard of fairness. The 2013 Boston Marathon bombings killed three people and injured more than 260. Sarnayev is being held at a supermax prison in Colorado. Former Edmonton nightclub consultant Matthew McKnight was sentenced to eight years in prison today for a string of sexual assaults dating back years. His sentence less than half of what the prosecution sought. Rafi Bujikanian now with the reaction. I genuinely had this crazy hope of like, you know, maybe this is, you know, just, I just had it higher expectations. Matthew McKnight's victims thought they would get justice today. They're talking about how he's a first offender, right? For years, Matt McKnight worked as a promoter inside this now defunct Edmonton nightclub. 13 women allege he sexually assaulted them, often appearing at Knoxville's in onesies, buying them drinks, taking them to his nearby condo. A jury found him guilty of five counts. The Crown wanted him to face 22 years of jail time. That was a carefully considered um, uh, determination about what a fit and appropriate sentence would be. But a justice cited McKnight's apparent remorse, ability to rehabilitate, and an assault he suffered while in remand as reasons to offer the lighter sentence of eight years. Saying that he didn't like the sandwiches and the and the oranges in prison and, and crying that he was that he was abused in prison, how how is that on the shoulders of the victims? from McKnight's defense lawyer, relief, even as his client is put back behind bars. It's hard to say that this was part of a pattern of predatory conduct. Rather, it was five separate times over a six-year period. But advocates warn this sentence will have negative impacts. I think it is going to actually increase uh, distrust in the criminal justice system. It's going to prevent survivors from coming forward. Still, this alleged victim, one McKnight was not found guilty of assaulting, says there is reason for hope. The first time now is like we're starting to have a voice and maybe this isn't a win, but it still shows like the reality of what's happening right now. The spotlight on these women may not fade quite yet, as the Crown says it will consider an appeal. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. Governor General Julie Payette addressed her staff directly tonight for what's believed to be the first time after reports of bullying and harassment at Rideau Hall. CBC News obtained an internal memo in which the Governor General says, I am listening and I remain fully committed to our team and our mission. She also said it is imperative to stay united and work together to find a solution. Rideau Hall's workplace environment is under review by the Privy Council office. This follows a CBC News report where more than a dozen sources alleged Payette and her official secretary created a toxic work environment. Ahead tonight, the national interview with Gary Bettman. Nothing is risk-free. The NHL commissioner on the return of hockey, keeping players safe, and racial injustice in the league. Racism is unacceptable. <laughs> Eid looks a little different this year, with lineups stretching kilometers to celebrate safely. Everybody was desperate to come and feel good, feel that we belong to a community. And Beyonce's new visual album, why Black is King is a game changer for fans. We will no longer apologize for being black. We're back in two. Seven people have been killed after two planes crashed mid-air in Alaska. It happened this morning near an airport in Soldotna, a three-hour drive southwest of Anchorage. A state lawmaker among those killed, he was piloting one of the planes. There were no survivors. 
UK's plans to further ease its coronavirus lockdown tomorrow have been postponed because of a rise in the rate of infections. We cannot be complacent and I won't stand by and allow this virus to threaten to cause more pain and more heartache in our country. That means for at least two weeks, businesses where there is close contact must remain closed. That includes casinos, bowling alleys and wedding receptions. Face coverings will also become mandatory in more places. Amid a surge in COVID-19 cases, Hong Kong has moved to postpone local elections that were set to take place in September. But as Sasha Petrasik tells us, pro-democracy campaigners say the pandemic is being used to suppress opposition. Late on Friday in Hong Kong, along with the rain, the political storm intensified with the announcement by government leader Carrie Lam. <laughs> Legislative elections to be delayed by a year to make the vote safe from COVID, she says. Infections here have doubled in the past month, but they still sit at just over 3,000, low compared to much of the world. And for many in Hong Kong, it's just an excuse. They suspect political motives by the Chinese Communist Party, Lam's backers in Beijing. I knew the government wouldn't let us vote, she says. It's disappointing. After more than a year of pro-democracy protests, Beijing is spooked by the prospect of a big win by opposition candidates, giving them a legislative majority. They've already disrupted government plans in council chambers, and they have big support among voters who came out en masse in recent primaries. So now Beijing is using a tough new national security law imposed on Hong Kong a month ago to crack down, disqualifying a dozen popular opposition candidates. However, in order to safeguard the city's future, Hong Kongers will not surrender and our resistance will continue arresting prominent student leaders in the middle of the night in Hong Kong, issuing warrants for those who have fled to oppose China from abroad. I'm just representing um, a large portion of Hong Kong people who are in support of our autonomy and democracy. And now the election delay. It's been condemned by the U.S., the U.K. and others. But as far as China's concerned, whatever it does in Hong Kong is no longer anyone else's business. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. NHL hockey returns tomorrow, so tonight we talk to Gary Bettman. It's going to be really hard to win the Cup. The NHL commissioner on playing safely and what the Stanley Cup means in a season unlike any other. And a very unlikely friendship in Edmonton that could be straight out of a Disney movie. Puppy love in tonight's moment. Jumping up is Morgan Riley. Nice pass to Tavares. Mikheyev is with him in front. And he scores. Can you tell a Leafs fan put that together? Anyway, it's what fans have been waiting for. Highlight real goals, big hits, and their favorite players back on the ice. Up until now, the games have been just exhibitions, though. So the countdown is on for the puck to drop on a season restart in just a few hours. Getting to this point, however, hasn't been easy. Missile. It is gone. For fans of pro sports, the return to play has been a welcome diversion from life in a pandemic, but also a reminder that COVID is never far away. Anderson's first home run of the season. Major League Baseball was hit shortly after the season started. One team, the Miami Marlins, decimated by positive tests, leading to postponed games, and questions about whether it's practical for teams to travel from city to city. The alternative is for all of them to play in one place, which the NBA is doing in Orlando. The bubble may be protecting players from COVID, but it isn't isolating them from one of the other big stories of the summer, demonstrations against racial injustice, reflected on opening night. Tomorrow, the NHL begins playing games that matter. All the teams inside bubbles in Edmonton and Toronto. And if all goes according to plan, the Stanley Cup will be handed out in October. So, is the NHL's plan working? Earlier today, I spoke with the league commissioner, Gary Bettman. Mr. Bettman, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you for having me. 
when we talk about COVID here in Canada, and I'm sure in the States as well, two words keep coming up. One is unpredictable and unprecedented. And with that in mind, as we get set for the games that count in the NHL this year, how are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling fortunate that we've gotten to the place that we are. Uh, our players and our fans were telling us overwhelmingly over the last 140 days that they thought it would be important uh, representing a return to normalcy if we could conclude the 1920 season. And uh, we've been able to put ourselves in a position by creating two bubbles, two hubs, one in Toronto and one in Edmonton, where we think we can be safe, we can be healthy, as can the communities that we're playing in. And health and safety has always been paramount in what we've been focused on. Now, having said that, uh, in this unpredictable, as you said, environment, uh, nothing is risk-free, but we've been working very hard uh, with our own people, with the health authorities at all levels, to make sure that we were doing everything sensible, practical, uh, to make sure that we were taking care of health and safety. What happens if a player does test positive for COVID? Well, it, it appears, and anything that happens will be under the guidance of people and the, and the health authorities, uh, that person will be immediately isolated and we'll do some contact tracing and figure out uh, who we have to keep an eye on going forward. The anticipating your next question, how many is too many? Frankly, I'd like not to see one. Uh, and in, in effect, uh, we, we ran 2,500 tests on 800 players uh, and there were no positives. And as we got into the bubble, uh, there have been tests on everybody every day. So we're into the thousands of tests and they've all been negative. Uh, and I've actually seen a player quoted as saying, uh, being in the bubble is the safest he's felt since mid-March. So we wanted to make sure that we went to great lengths to anticipate every eventuality and wanted to be flexible enough to react to whatever we needed to do. So COVID, one of the big stories, obviously, of 2020. The other big story in the last couple of months has been uh, demonstrations against yeah. anti-black racism. The NHL has announced that there will be some social justice element tomorrow uh, during those opening yes. games for the first time. Why do that? Well, we think it's important for us to, to make a difference in people's lives. Racism is unacceptable. Uh, and we want to make sure that everybody understands where we stand on that issue. We want our game. It's always it's part of our declaration of principles and our values. We want our game to be welcoming to everyone, to be diverse, to create a friendly environment. And to the extent that, that racism has been or is an issue with the game at any level, we want to make sure we want people to understand what our game stands for. And we want people who play hockey at every level to feel welcome uh, and we also think it's important that our clubs and our players have the opportunity to express themselves or not express themselves as they see fit what would you do if a player or a team came to you and said that a player wants to kneel during the anthem uh, our, uh, we haven't like some of the other major leagues we've never had a rule that says you can't players are free to express themselves or not express themselves uh, it's individual choice. Evander Kane, a member of the San Jose Sharks, a, a Canadian, a, a black man, uh, is a member of a hockey diversity alliance, which yes. has other players of color. And in an interview with TSN here in Canada, he said, and I'll read you the quote, the NHL can put Black Lives Matter all over the rink, shout Black Lives Matter from the mountains. No matter what they do or say, it's all gonna fall on deaf ears with me and every other person in the HDA, the, the alliance, because the league has made no effort to support its own black players. And in that TSN article, he goes on to say that he's made specific requests to you and the league, which uh, haven't been answered or satisfied. What do you say to that? Well, guys, two things. One, I have the utmost respect for Van Der Kane, uh, but A, he, he's really not particularly well versed on all of the efforts that we've made over the last couple of decades to move forward. And I do think we need to do better. And, and B, uh, the Hockey Diversity Alliance is a very new organization. It may be, at least in terms of its coming to us, 
a month old. Uh, they formed it. We knew nothing about it, which was fine. They announced it. We didn't know that the announcement was going to be made, and then they've asked to engage. And we've been in a dialogue because, frankly, our goals and the goals of the Hockey Diversity Alliance are identical. We want to make sure there's no racism in our sport. The methodology to get there is something we're talking about and looking at ways to work together. So, so give me an example uh, in a practical way of, of how, can, how we can do that, because we all obviously agree with the statement or platitude that there must not be racism. It's a far different thing to try to change the culture of hockey from the NHL all the way down to a community rink somewhere in rural Canada or the United States. So g give me one sort of example of how we change that. Well, first of all, we need to make sure that people are appropriately educated in terms of, of being more aware of what's important to our black players, not just our black players, but black players at any level of the game. And any, frankly, any people of color or anybody with any that background. Um, and so we must understand and respect the differences. Uh, we must make sure that acts that are inappropriate aren't tolerated. And we have a history of that. Uh, players have been suspended for saying inappropriate things uh, and in fact, so have some executives. So what we need to do is set a good example and make sure people know what is and isn't acceptable. Now you would think people might know that, but that's not always the case. So part of that is having the difficult conversations so that we can all understand and respect what's important uh, and what issues have, been, have to be addressed particularly for our black players and for black players at any level of the game. Some people online are wondering whether there will forever be an asterisk after the name of the 2020 Stanley Cup winner. Your view on that? Uh, my guess is if there's an asterisk, it's going to be because this was harder to win than at any other time in the modern age. Uh, our players, and you got to take your hats off and tip your hat to them uh, and be really admiring their passion for the game because the ultimate champion will have been in the bubble for over two months away from family and friends. And interestingly enough, when we had the return to play discussions with the players, we said, maybe we should shorten it so you're not away as much if you're the ultimate champion. So let's play the first and second rounds after the playing round, best of five. And the players said, absolutely not. We want to go through the same rigors that we would be in a normal year, best of seven for all four rounds. Uh, so that tells you how much the competitiveness and the integrity of winning the Stanley Cup means to our players and ultimately to our fans. Well, a lot of hockey fans in this country, as you know, and we're really looking forward to tomorrow morning here on, on the West Coast. Mr. Bettman, thank you very much. Thanks for having me and everybody. Please be safe, stay healthy. As the NHL kicks off at 9 a.m. tomorrow Pacific time, Major League Baseball will mark its second week of meaningful games. As you heard, though, the league is dealing with a growing outbreak which sidelined yet another team today. Two players on the St. Louis Cardinals are the latest to test positive. Their game tonight against Milwaukee has now been postponed. That makes a total of 15 games delayed because of COVID-19 and counting. As many as 20 members of the Miami Marlins and two in the Philadelphia Phillies organization tested positive this past week. When we come back celebrating Eid during a pandemic. We're really excited. We're so happy to be here today. A much needed gathering after spending months apart. A community's collective moment is next. This is a holiday weekend for many Canadians, but for Muslims, it is Eid al-Adha, a time for devotion and gathering. Helen Morrow tells us how that tradition has changed in the age of COVID-19. A day of joy, changed, but nowhere near dampened by COVID. We're really excited. I'm so happy to be here today. Hundreds of cars lined up to snake through this mosque parking lot. Mobile festivities with cool treats, a juggler, even animals, as this community shared a collective moment, separate in their vehicles, but still together, celebrating Eid al-Adha, one of the most important days in the Muslim calendar.
We are like very lucky to have Isna here, like making like this drive through. And after months of lockdown, this celebration is all the more needed, says this father. Especially for kids, because they are so bored, like staying at home so uh, for so long time. So now, like uh, to get like out and to uh, have this fun, you know, and especially in this occasion so it's very uh, for sure uh, very happy for this How are you? Thank you. a similar event was held in Moncton where eight-year-old Zachariah Samad celebrated with his dad it is cool but I do miss the you know other times but we have to do this for safety and in Yellowknife to mark the occasion a physically distanced barbecue at this Toronto mosque, Friday prayers too came with COVID precautions as worshippers reflected on the meaning of the day. The message of, of hope, uh, the message of resiliency, you know, we are realizing uh, what's important to us and what matters to us because this pandemic, uh, there's lots of, of challenges. Many of those challenges remain, but today at least was a happy reprieve. Ellen Morrow, CBC News. Toronto. Nearly 9,000 Canadians with COVID-19 have now died, and CBC News is telling their stories through a special project called Lives Remembered. Tonight, Tony Ince remembers his mother. My name is Tony Ince. I lost my mother, Thelma Coward Ince, to COVID-19 April 17, 2020. She was 86 years old. My mom was born in Whitney Pier, Sydney, Cape Breton. At 16, she left Cape Breton. She came to Halifax, enlisted in the reserves in the Canadian Navy. And that to me says a lot. A young black woman at the age of 16, take that step. She was the first. She began working for the uh, Department of National Defense. She became the base commander's secretary. She was also instrumental in advocating for proper pensions for those that worked in the federal government. There's just so many things that she had done that surprises me. My mom always loved music. After she retired, she joined the Nova Scotia Mass Choir from the 90s up until probably about four years before her dementia hit. My mom just loved it, and when she was doing the Mass Choir, you could see her face light up. As a member of the St. Thomas Baptist Church, she enjoyed her Masses. And uh, I'll stop there because I'm starting to get emotional thinking about how that filled her up with joy. I had a mom that was there for me no matter what. Her influences make me the man I am today. Who I am is essentially, I'm my mother's son. We've gathered more stories of people lost to COVID-19 on our website. You can find them at cbc.ca slash remembered. Ahead tonight, calling out systemic racism in the Canadian film industry, but first... The message behind Beyonce's new visual album, super fans on Black is King, right after the break. King already, my baby, you know it. Top everything, everything, you know it. King already, already, you know it. Beyonce has released a video album celebrating black culture at a time of heightened awareness of anti-black racism. But while some question whether Black is King will have the power to change thinking, Eli Glasner tells us it's been eagerly awaited by her loyal fans. She has a stage presence that is second to none. Beyonce superfan Andre Gordon has seen his queen in concert twice and has big plans for today. We are going to pop our popcorn, bring our snacks, bring our wine, and most importantly, bring our Beyonce-ness. What Beyonce brought them is a celebration of African culture inspired by her work on The Lion King. You can't wear a crown with your head down. The question is, who are you? To better understand Beyonce, writer-producer Kathleen Newman-Bremang 
played me some of her favorite jams. We are here, we've arrived, you cannot take us out of these spaces. And they're beautiful. She says Beyonce has a history of using her music to send a message. Talking about black liberation, with talking about black motherhood, um, with injecting feminist lyrics and works into her work, which I think is, is unprecedented. And Beyonce has often used her celebrity to lift up other artists. She made sure that her Vogue cover, going back to Vogue, was shot by a black man. And she is a groundbreaker. But this professor says the fact that Beyonce is so unique says a lot. It's a testament to her particular skill, but it, and it's also a testament to the kinds of female blackness that the world is willing to accept. Beyonce has Nefertiti. But for this super fan, Beyonce is redefining what it means to be black. It's finally time that Africa has a voice and we have this lovely piece of history to look back on and think, oh my God, it wasn't always that hard time. We have, we have beauty and we have the intellect. We birth kings. We birth kings. At a time when the pandemic is disproportionately affecting people of color, what fans are getting is a booster shot of black pride. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. And black film creators here in Canada are standing up against anti-black racism in their industry. They say they're underfunded compared to their peers. As Jayla Bernstein tells us, they're speaking out in a bid to produce change. It is incredibly difficult to make films and television in Canada as a black creator. After 20 years in the film industry, various awards and accolades, Jennifer Holness says getting funding isn't getting easier. I am the most senior black female filmmaker in the country. I got $45,000 in development. Telefilm gives out $40 million a year. She says the Black Lives Matter movement inspired her to demand change. We all have been sort of like, you know, punching it out for years and years and years. And these systemic barriers, no one seemed to notice, uh, you know, no one seemed to care. And, um, and we just felt like we had to say something. That led to this letter, signed by nine prominent black Canadian filmmakers and sent to the heritage minister. It calls out anti-black racism in the Canadian screen-based industries. It also proposes the creation of a black screen office. Holness and her colleagues met with the minister this week. Afterwards, Stephen Gilbo's office issued this statement, calling the meeting an important step in our commitment to create more space for diverse stories and perspectives in order to make lasting changes. Sandy. Telefilm Canada is also pledging to do better. Do you think that there is anti-black racism in Canadian screen-based industries in general? Do you think that that's a problem that exists? Yes, I, I think that, that it does. And, and Telefilm has acknowledged the existence of that um, systemic racism. There have also been recent calls for more transparency on which filmmakers are getting more funding. We want a uh, hard her data to show that, in fact, uh, you know, systemic racism has kept a lot of filmmakers out of the system. Telefilm says it's going to share more about how its funding is allocated and do more to hire and support people from underrepresented communities. It is a firm commitment. It is a genuine commitment that we have started the, the conversation with them. Holness says she's hopeful. She says she has a lot to offer as a filmmaker and hopes to see the barriers in her way soon broken down. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Next on The National, a story that sounds like a Disney classic. This fox and hound and their unlikely friendship next in our moment. From their homes. I gotta get in shape for this. All right, you gotta record that to one. To yours. Yeah, go East Coast. I can now say I'm working from home. How Canadian was this? Juno's 365 Songwriter Circle. All episodes now streaming on CBC Gem. The Fox and the Hound might sound like the title of an old movie, but in Alberta, it's real. Hank the dog and Willow the fox are best friends. Their unlikely friendship forms suddenly, and it's our moment. One day she appeared, and uh, it's been a couple months now, so she just follows the dog everywhere. So he's an inside dog, but when we let him out, they're stuck together. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, she's adorable. <laughs> so of course, she's just she was just a pup, so. Come on, hey. When we first saw her, she was just 
following him and I was just called my husband and I was like, look, and they've been <laughs> inseparable. So I've called her Willow. So she, if I give her a yodel like Willow, 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 she'll pop out, look for him. And then he actually gets down and plays with her and chases her and they chase each other back and forth. So I have animals and I'm out here all the time with them. So they follow me around. And so she just kind of tags along. I like having her around. Wendy says a willow can stick around as long as willow wants unless, and you draw the line somewhere, unless willow kills one of those goats, and then willow has to go. So in case you're wondering, that is the National for July 31st. Good night.